Hi, I'm Mitch Steiner. I'm the CEO of GTX. Uh, I'm also a urologist. GTX has been doing a lot of research on possible new drugs in the management of prostate cancer. Can you talk a little about drug development in prostate cancer? One of the unique uh, opportunities we have today is the fact that prostate cancer went from an acute disease to a chronic disease. And when I left my residency, and if somebody had prostate cancer, advanced prostate cancer is what I'm talking about, uh, I would tell them you have, after castration therapy, you had 24 months to 36 months to live. And that was it. And, uh, and then also during that period of time, the way that patients were treated was by surgical castration. And since that time, urology has moved in a direction where there's now medicines that take care of this kind of stuff. So really two concepts. One is medicines in urology instead of surgery. And then two, taking prostate cancer where somebody was given a death sentence and they were gone 24 months and 36 months. And actually these patients are living 10 to 15 years, if not longer. So now the problem is, can you do one of two things? And this is kind of what we're doing at GTX. And one of the two things is, one is, can you come up with more effective therapies, okay, with less toxicity? And two, can you manage the side effects of these drugs that are keeping patients alive more than 24 months and 36 months? So they're being alive now for, as I mentioned, 15 to 20 years. So I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, a drug uh, that is used to treat patients with advanced prostate cancer is a drug that's called uh, an LHRH uh, agonist. Uh, some names are like Luprolide, Lupron, Eligard, to give you sort of a flavor, okay? And these drugs, the way they work is you get an injection, it shuts off testosterone, essentially, and the patients become castrated. But over time, what's happening is not only is testosterone being lowered, but their estrogens are being, estrogen levels are being lowered. Why? Well, it turns out in a male, estrogen comes from testosterone. So if you castrate testosterone, you castrate estrogen. So now, what happens in a long-term setting with no estrogen around? I'll tell you. One, you get bone loss. Okay, and the bone loss leads to fractures. And we were able to study this problem, found out that one, and, and men on, on, on ADT, ADT is androgen deprivation therapy, which is Lupron, Zolodex, those kinds of drugs, one in four men will develop a fracture or lose greater than 7% bone. Okay, so it's a serious problem. And unfortunately, with fractures, fractures kill. Fractures kill in two ways. If it's a hip fracture, mortality is still 50%. And two, when you compare men on androgen deprivation therapy uh, 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 with, with bone loss and a fracture compared to those without, the ones with a fracture have uh, reduced life expectancy. So there's a way to treat the bone loss. The other things that happen with estrogen deficiency is hot flashes. In fact, symptomatic hot flashes are the number one complaint that patients have, and as many as 80% 80, 80 of patients have a complaint of hot flashes. These hot flashes are a little different than hot flashes that happen in postmenopausal women because the hot flashes that occur in postmenopausal women tend to go away with time. Uh, they wax and wane because postmenopausal women, still most of them have their ovaries in unless they had the surgery. And so it comes and goes. With these men, mm -mm. it hits hard, stays with them, doesn't go away with time. And so that's, again, an estrogen-related side effect. Lipid changes. Uh, mean your cholesterol levels change. That leads to cardiovascular disease also ha happens. And then the other interesting thing that happens in the settings is that patients uh, grow breasts and get breast pain called gynecomastia. So all of those are related to the estrogen receptor. So for example, well, how can you fix that? Well, the answer is if you can give uh, an estrogen-like product that doesn't affect the castration but treat all those side effects, because these patients are going to live 10 to 15 years, then now you have a situation where you have cancer supportive care and cancer therapy. So at GTX, we came up with a drug called terimiphene 80 milligrams that, that has been in testing uh, and it's completed a phase three study, it was a positive study, moving to a second phase three study where we asked that question. What we're able to show is a reduction in fractures by 50%, patients had less hot flashes, uh, the gynecomastia was improved, the lipid changes moved in the right direction, the bone uh, loss was less, and so the proof of principle occurred. So one way to develop drugs is to come in with cancer supportive care. The other way to develop drugs is to, is to come up with a drug that's less toxic and just as effective. Because if you're going to be around a long time, wouldn't it be nice to do that? So for example, at GTX, we have a new product called GTX 758.
And GTX758 is an oral drug that you take by mouth and it shuts off testosterone. Okay, just like the lupulides and luprons that are done by injectable. The difference is because of the selectivity of the drug, you're not seeing the, you're not seeing the bone loss. You don't have the hot flashes. Uh, potency may be spared. Um, uh, lipid change is going to be more like female lipids, which are which are good for cardiovascular. And uh, and and if you can and the other interesting feature of this is you can get a subcastrate level of testosterone because of the way the drug works. That drug now is in phase two. So developing drugs that are more effective with less toxicity or developing drugs to take care of the side effects of effective drugs is where, uh, where, is where we could help in this field in which prostate cancer patients, there are large numbers of them that, that are going to be around for a while, but they need their therapy and need effective therapies. You're looking at drugs that can prevent prostate cancer as well. Can you tell us about the status of this research? We ran a study with 1,600 patients asking the question, can we prevent prostate cancer? But we were a little bit more bold than that. We picked a patient population that is at high risk for developing prostate cancer. And these are patients that have a pre-malignant lesion of the prostate called high-grade PIN. The problem is when we started the study 14 years ago, uh, the feeling was we didn't really know how patients with high-grade PIN, what was that rate that they converted to prostate cancer. And it was everything from 100% to uh, what people felt was uh, no different than the average population. And we really didn't know. Now, GTX took the position they were at high risk. Why? Because when you look at high-grade pin under the microscope, it looks just like prostate cancer, and it just hasn't invaded yet. So you would have called it carcinoma in situ. And what we showed in our study, and we reported this last week, just top-line data, is that 45% of these patients at year three had prostate cancer. This is the highest risk group. So the good news from a standpoint of advancing the science is that we've now showed that anybody with a pre-malignant lesion of the prostate should never be told not to do anything. Okay, so that's a big step. The drug had modest activity, terimiphene 20, it was about a 10% reduction in prostate cancer. We have to look at the full data set to see what our next steps are gonna be. But I do think that chemo prevention, stopping the cancer from occurring in the first place, really is the right way to go. And we have to keep slugging at it. Uh, but that would be another big advancement in prostate cancer drugs. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the work that is ongoing in this area? Medicines and prostate cancer and the development of medicines and prostate cancer are challenging, uh, but the reward is that there's so many people that are affected by prostate cancer remains the number one diagnosed disease, uh, a diagnosed cancer, and a second killer in men. And the, what I'd like to leave you with is don't let people tell you that prostate cancer doesn't matter. Prostate cancer kills, and the fact it is a second killer in men means that it can't be benign.